Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 1. Boyhood and Youth. My grandfather, on my father's side, was of almost purely Dutch blood. When he was young, he still spoke some Dutch, and Dutch was last used in the services of the Dutch Reformed Church in New York while he was a small boy. About 1644, his ancestor, Claes Martinson van Roosevelt, came to New Amsterdam as a settler, the euphemistic name for an immigrant who came over in the steerage of a sailing ship in the 17th century, instead of the steerage of a steamer in the 19th century. From that time for the next seven generations, from father to son, every one of us was born on Manhattan Island. My father's paternal ancestors were of Holland stock, except that there was one named Waldron, a wheelwright, who was one of the pilgrims who remained in Holland when the others came over to found Massachusetts, and who then accompanied the Dutch adventurers to New Amsterdam. My father's mother was a Pennsylvanian. Her forebears had come to Pennsylvania with William Penn, some in the same ship with him. They were of the usual type of the immigration of that particular place and time. They included Welsh and English Quakers, an Irishman with a Celtic name, and apparently not a Quaker, and peace-loving Germans, who were among the founders of Germantown, having been driven from their Rhineland homes when the armies of Louis the Fourteenth ravaged the Palatinate and, in addition, representatives of a by no means altogether peaceful people, the Scotch-Irish, who came to Pennsylvania a little later, early in the 18th century. My grandmother was a woman of singular sweetness and strength, the keystone of the arch in her relations with her husband and sons. Although she was not herself Dutch, it was she who taught me the only Dutch I ever knew, a baby song, of which the first line ran, Trip a trop patronius. I always remembered this, and when I was in East Africa, it proved a bond of union between me and the Boer settlers, not a few of whom knew it, although at first they always had difficulty in understanding my pronunciation, at which I do not wonder. It was interesting to meet these men whose ancestors had gone to the Cape about the time that mine went to America two centuries and a half previously, and to find that the descendants of the two streams of emigrants still crooned to their children some at least of the same nursery songs. Of my great-grandfather Roosevelt and his family life a century and over ago, I knew little beyond what is implied in some of his books and have come down to me. The Letters of Junius, a biography of John Paul Jones, Chief Justice Marshall's Life in Washington. They seem to indicate that his library was less interesting than that of my wife's great-grandfather at the same time, which certainly included such volumes as the original Edinburgh Review, for we have them now on our own bookshelves. Of my grandfather Roosevelt, my most vivid childish reminiscence is not something I saw, but a tale that was told me concerning him. In his boyhood, Sunday was as dismal a day for small Calvinistic children of Dutch descent as if they had been of Puritan or Scotch Covenanting or French Huguenot descent, and I speak as one proud of his Holland, Huguenot and Covenanting ancestors, and proud that the blood of that stark Puritan divine Jonathan Edwards flows in the veins of his children. One summer afternoon, after listening to an unusually long Dutch Reformed sermon for the second time that day, my grandfather, a small boy, running home before the congregation had dispersed, ran into a party of pigs, which then wandered free in New York streets. He promptly mounted a big boar, which no less promptly bolted and carried him at full speed through the midst of the outraged congregation. By the way, one of the Roosevelt documents which came down to me illustrates the change that has come over certain aspects of public life since the time which pessimists term the earlier and better days of the Republic. Old Isaac Roosevelt was a member of an auditing committee which, shortly after the close of the Revolution, approved the following bill. The State of New York to John Cape, Doctor. 
to a dinner given by His Excellency, the Governor and Council to their Excellencies, the Minister of France and General Washington and Company. 1783, December. To 120 dinners at 48 pounds. To 135 bottles Madeira, 54 pounds. To 36 bottles of port, 10 pounds, 16 shillings. To 16 bottles English beer, 9 pounds. To 30 bulls punch, 9 pounds. To 8 dinners for music, 1 pound, 12 shillings. To 10 dinners for servants, 2 pounds. To 60 wine glasses broken, 4 pounds, 10 shillings. To 8 cut decanters broken, 3 pounds. To coffee for 8 gentlemen, 1 pound, 12 shillings. To music fees, etc., 8 pounds. To fruit and nuts, 5 pounds. Total, 156 pounds, 10 shillings. By cash, 100 pounds, 16 shillings. 55 pounds, 14 shillings. We, a committee of council, having examined the above account, do certify it, amounting to 156 pounds, 10 shillings, to be just. December 17th, 1783. Isaac Roosevelt, James Duane, Egbert Benson, Frederick J., received the above contents in full, New York, 17th December, 1783. John Cape. Think of the governor of New York now submitting such a bill for such an entertainment of the French ambassador and the president of the United States. Falstaff's views of the proper proportion between sack and bread are borne out by the proportion between the number of bowls of punch and bottles of port, Madeira, and beer consumed, and the coffee for eight gentlemen, apparently the only ones who lasted through to that stage of the dinner. Especially admirable is the nonchalant manner in which, obviously, as a result of the drinking of said bottles of wine and bowls of punch, it is recorded that eight cut-glass decanters and sixty wine-glasses were broken. During the Revolution, some of my forefathers, North and South, served respectably, but without distinction in the army and others rendered similar service in the continental congress or in various local legislatures by that time those who dwelt in the north were for the most part merchants and those who dwelt in the south planters my mother's people were predominantly of scotch but also of huguenot and english descent she was a georgian her people having come to georgia from south carolina before the revolution the original Bullock was a lad from near Glasgow, who came hither a couple of centuries ago, just as hundreds of thousands of needy, enterprising Scotchmen have gone to the four quarters of the globe in the intervening two hundred years. My mother's great-grandfather, Archibald Bullock, was the first revolutionary president of Georgia. My grandfather, her father spent the winters in Savannah and the summers at Roswell in the Georgia uplands near Atlanta, finally making Roswell his permanent home. He used to travel thither with his family and their belongings in his own carriage, followed by a baggage wagon. I never saw Roswell until I was president, but my mother told me so much about the place that, when I did see it, I felt as if I already knew every nook and corner of it, and as if it were haunted by the ghosts of all the men and women who have lived there. I do not mean merely my own family, I mean the slaves. My mother and her sister, my aunt, used to tell us children all kinds of story about the slaves. One of the most fascinating referred to a very old darky called Bear Bob, because in the early days of settlement he had been partially scalped by a black bear. Then there was Mom Grace, who was for a time my mother's nurse, and whom I had supposed to be dead, but who greeted me when I did come to Roswell, very respectable and apparently with years of life before her. The two chief personages of the drama that used to be repeated to us were Daddy Luke, the Negro overseer, and his wife, 
Mom Charlotte. I never saw either Daddy Luke or Mom Charlotte, but I inherited the care of them when my mother died. After the close of the war, they resolutely refused to be emancipated or leave the place. The only demand they made upon us was enough money annually to get a new critter, that is, a mule. With a certain lack of ingenuity, the mule was reported each Christmas as having passed away, or at least as having become so infirm as to necessitate a successor, a solemn fiction which neither deceived nor was intended to deceive, but which furnished a gauge for the size of the Christmas gift. My maternal grandfather's house was on the line of Sherman's march to the sea, and pretty much everything in it that was portable was taken by the boys in blue, including most of the books in the library. When I was president, the facts about my ancestry were published, and a former soldier in Sherman's army sent me back one of the books with my grandfather's name in it. It was a little copy of the poems of Mr. Gray, an 18th century edition printed in Glasgow. On October 27, 1858, I was born at number 28 East 20th Street, New York City, in a house in which we lived during the time that my two sisters and my brother and I were small children. It was furnished in the canonical taste of the New York which George William Curtis described in the Potiphar Papers. The black haircloth furniture in the dining room scratched the bare legs of the children when they sat on it. The middle room was a library, with tables, chairs, and bookcases of gloomy respectability. It was without windows, and so was available only at night. The front room, the parlor, seemed to us children to be a room of much splendor, but was open for general use only on Sunday evening or on rare occasions when there were parties. The Sunday evening family gathering was the redeeming feature in a day which otherwise we children did not enjoy, chiefly because we were all of us made to wear clean clothes and keep neat. The ornaments of that parlor I remember now, including the gas chandelier decorated with a great quantity of cut glass prisms. These prisms struck me as possessing peculiar magnificence. One of them fell off one day, and I hastily grabbed it and stowed it away, passing several days of furtive delight in the treasure, a delight always alloyed with fear that I would be found out and convicted of larceny. There was a Swiss wood carving, representing a very big hunter on one side of an exceedingly small mountain, and a herd of chamois, disproportionately small for the hunter, and large for the mountain, just across the ridge. This always fascinated us, but there was a small chamois kid for which we felt agonies, lest the hunter might come on it and kill it. There was also a Russian mujik drawing, a gilt sledge on a piece of a malachite. Someone mentioned in my hearing that malachite was a valuable marble. This fixed in my mind that it was valuable exactly as diamonds are valuable. I accepted that mujik as a priceless work of art and it was not until I was well in middle age that it occurred to me that I was mistaken. Now and then we children were taken round to our grandfather's house, a big house for the New York of those days, on the corner of 14th Street and Broadway, fronting Union Square. Inside there was a large hall running up to the roof. There was a tessellated black-and-white marble floor and a circular staircase round the sides of the hall from the top floor down. We children much admired both the tessellated floor and the circular staircase. I think we were right about the latter, but I am not so sure as to the tessellated floor. The summers we spent in the country, now at one place, now at another. We children, of course, loved the country beyond anything. We disliked the city. We were always wildly eager to get to the country when spring came, and very sad when, in the late fall, the family moved back to town. In the country, we of course had all kinds of pets. Cats, dogs, rabbits, a coon, and a sorrel Shetland pony named General Grant. 
When my younger sister first heard of the real General Grant, by the way, she was much struck by the coincidence that someone should have given him the same name as the pony. Thirty years later, my own children had their pony Grant. In the country, we children ran barefoot much of the time, and the seasons went by in a round of uninterrupted and enthralling pleasures, supervising the haying and harvesting, picking apples, hunting frogs successfully and woodchucks unsuccessfully, gathering hickory nuts and chestnuts for sale to patient parents, building wigwams in the woods, and sometimes playing Indians in the too realistic manner by staining ourselves, and incidentally our clothes, in liberal fashion with poke cherry juice. Thanksgiving was an appreciated festival, but in no way came up to Christmas. Christmas was an occasion of literally delirious joy. In the evening we hung up our stockings, or rather the biggest stockings we could borrow from the grown-ups, and before dawn we trooped in to open them while sitting on father's and mother's bed, and the bigger presents were arranged, those for each child on its own table, in the drawing-room, the doors to which were thrown open after breakfast. I never knew anyone else have what seemed to me such attractive Christmases, and in the next generation I tried to reproduce them exactly for my own children. My father, Theodore Roosevelt, was the best man I ever knew. He combined strength and courage with gentleness, tenderness, and great unselfishness. He would not tolerate in us children selfishness or cruelty, idleness, cowardice or untruthfulness. As we grew older, he made us understand that the same standard of clean living was demanded for the boys as for the girls, that what was wrong in a woman could not be right in a man. With great love and patience, and the most understanding sympathy and consideration, he combined insistence on discipline. He never physically punished me but once but he was the only man of whom I was ever really afraid. I do not mean that it was a wrong fear, for he was entirely just, and we children adored him. We used to wait in the library in the evening until we could hear his key rattling in the latch of the front hall, and then rush out to greet him. And we would troop into his room while he was dressing, to stay there as long as we were permitted, eagerly examining anything which came out of his pockets which could be regarded as an attractive novelty. Every child has fixed in his memory various details which strike it as of grave importance. The trinkets he used to keep in a little box on his dressing table we children always used to speak of as treasures. The word, and some of the trinkets themselves, passed on to the next generation. My own children, when small, used to troop into my room while I was dressing, and the gradually accumulating trinkets in the ditty box, the gift of an enlisted man in the Navy, always excited rapturous joy. On occasions of solemn festivity, each child would receive a trinket for his or her very own. My children, by the way, enjoyed one pleasure I do not remember enjoying myself. When I came back from riding, the child who brought the boot-jack would itself promptly get into the boots and clump up and down the room with the delightful feeling of kinship with Jack of the Seven League Strides. The punishing incident I have referred to happened when I was four years old. I bit my elder sister's arm. I do not remember biting her arm, but I do remember running down to the yard, perfectly conscious that I had committed a crime. From the yard I went into the kitchen, got some dough from the cook, and crawled under the kitchen table. In a minute or two my father entered from the yard and asked where I was. The warm-hearted Irish cook had a characteristic contempt for informers, but although she said nothing, she compromised between informing and her conscience by casting a look under the table. My father immediately dropped on all fours and darted for me. I feebly heaved the dough at him, and having the advantage of him because I could stand up under the table, got a fair start for the stairs, but was caught halfway up them. The punishment that ensued fitted the crime, and I hope and believe that it did me good. 
I never knew any one who got greater joy out of living than did my father, or any one who more wholeheartedly performed every duty, and no one whom I have ever met approached his combination of enjoyment of life and performance of duty. He and my mother were given to a hospitality that at that time was associated more commonly with southern than northern households, and especially in their later years when they had moved uptown in the neighborhood of Central Park, they kept a charming open house. My father worked hard at his business, for he died when he was forty-six, too early to have retired. He was interested in every social reform movement, and he did an immense amount of practical, charitable work himself. He was a big, powerful man, with a leonine face, and his heart filled with gentleness for those who needed help or protection, and with the possibility of much wrath against a bully or an oppressor. He was very fond of riding both on the road and across the country, and was also a great whip. He usually drove four in hand, or else a spike team, that is, a pair with a third horse in the lead. I do not suppose that such a team exists now. The trap that he drove we always called the high phaeton. The wheels turned under in front. I have it yet. He drove long-tailed horses, harnessed loose in light American harness, so that the whole rig had no possible resemblance to anything that would be seen now. My father always excelled in improving every spare half hour or three quarters of an hour, whether for work or enjoyment. Much of his four-in-hand driving was done in the summer afternoons when we would come out on the train from his business in New York. My mother and one or perhaps two of us children might meet him at the station. I can see him now getting out of the car in his linen duster, jumping into the wagon, and instantly driving off at a rattling pace, the duster sometimes bagging like a balloon. The four-in-hand, as can be gathered from the above description, did not in any way in his eyes represent possible pageantry. He drove it because he liked it. He was always preaching caution to his boys, but in this respect he did not practice his preaching over much himself, and being an excellent whip, he liked to take chances. Generally they came out all right. Occasionally they did not. But he was even better at getting out of a scrape than into it. Once, when we were driving into New York late at night, the leaders stopped. He flicked them, and the next moment we could dimly make out that they had jumped. It then appeared that the street was closed, and that a board had been placed across it, resting on two barrels, but without a lantern. Over this board the leaders had jumped, and there was considerable excitement before we got the board taken off the barrels and resumed our way. When in the city on Thanksgiving or Christmas, my father was very apt to drive my mother and a couple of friends up to the racing park to take lunch but he was always back in time to go to the dinner at the newsboy's lodging house, and not infrequently also to Miss Sattery's night school for little Italians. At a very early age, we children were taken with him and were required to help. He was a staunch friend of Charles Loring Brace, and was particularly interested in the newsboy's lodging house, and in the night schools, and in getting the children off the streets and out on farms in the West. When I was president, the governor of Alaska under me, Governor Brady, was one of these ex-newsboys who had been sent from New York out west by Mr. Brace and my father. My father was greatly interested in the societies to prevent cruelty to children and cruelty to animals. On Sundays he had a mission class. On his way to it, he used to drop us children at our Sunday school in Dr. Adams's Presbyterian Church on Madison Square. I remember hearing my aunt, my mother's sister, saying that when he walked along with us children, he always reminded her of Greatheart in Bunyan. Under the spur of his example, I taught a mission class myself for three years before going to college, and for all four years that I was in college. I do not think I made much of a success of it. But the other day, on getting out of a taxi in New York, the chauffeur spoke to me and told me that he was one of my old Sunday school pupils. 
I remembered him well, and was much pleased to find that he was an ardent bull mooser. My mother, Martha Bullock, was a sweet, gracious, beautiful southern woman, a delightful companion, and beloved by everybody. She was entirely unreconstructed to the day of her death. Her mother, my grandmother, one of the dearest of old ladies, lived with us, and was distinctly overindulgent to us children, being quite unable to harden her heart towards us even when the occasion demanded it. Towards the close of the Civil War, although a very small boy, I grew to have a partial but alert understanding of the fact that the family were not one in their views about that conflict, my father being a strong Lincoln Republican, and once, when I felt that I had been wronged by maternal discipline during the day, I attempted a partial vengeance by praying with loud fervor for the success of the Union arms, when we all came to say our prayers before my mother in the evening. She was not only a most devoted mother, but was also blessed with a strong sense of humor, and she was too much amused to punish me. But I was warned not to repeat the offense under penalty of my father's being informed, he being the dispenser of serious punishment. Morning prayers were with my father. We used to stand at the foot of the stairs, and when father came down, we called out, I speak for you in the cubbyhole, too. There were three of us young children, and we used to sit with father on the sofa while he conducted morning prayers. The place between father and the arm of the sofa we called the cubby hole. The children who got that place we regarded as especially favored, both in comfort and somehow or other in rank and title. The two who were left to sit in the much wider expanse of sofa on the other side of father were outsiders for the time being. My Aunt Anna, my mother's sister, lived with us. She was as devoted to us children as was my mother herself, and we were equally devoted to her in return. She taught us our lessons while we were little. She and my mother used to entertain us by the hour with tales of life on the Georgia plantations, of hunting fox, deer, and wildcat, of the long-tailed driving horses, Boone and Crockett, and of the riding horses, one of which was named Buena Vista, in a fit of patriotic exultation during the Mexican War, and of the queer goings-on in the Negro quarters. She knew all the Br'er Rabbit stories, and I was brought up on them. One of my uncles, Robert Roosevelt, was much struck with them, and he took them down from her dictation, publishing them in Harper's, where they fell flat. This was a good many years before a genius arose who, in Uncle Remus, made the stories immortal. My mother's two brothers, James Dunwoody Bullock and Irvine Bullock, came to visit us shortly after the close of the war. Both came under assumed names, as they were among the Confederates who were at that time exempted from the amnesty. Uncle Jimmy Bullock was a dear old retired sea captain, utterly unable to get on in the worldly sense of that phrase, as valiant and simple and upright a soul as ever lived, a veritable Colonel Newcomb. He was an admiral in the Confederate Navy, and was the builder of the famous Confederate war vessel Alabama. My uncle Irvine Bullock was a midshipman on the Alabama, and fired the last gun discharged from her batteries in the fight with the Kearsarge. Both of these uncles lived in Liverpool after the war. My uncle Jimmy Bullock was forgiving and just in reference to the Union forces, and could discuss all phases of the Civil War with entire fairness and generosity. But in English politics, he promptly became a Tory of the most ultra-conservative school. Lincoln and Grant he could admire, but he would not listen to anything in favor of Mr. Gladstone. The only occasions on which I ever shook his faith in me were when I would venture meekly to suggest that some of the manifestly preposterous falsehoods about Mr. Gladstone could not be true. My uncle was one of the best men I have ever known, and when I have sometimes been tempted to wonder how good people can believe of me the unjust and impossible things they do believe, 
I have consoled myself by thinking of Uncle Jimmy Bullock's perfectly sincere conviction that Gladstone was a man of quite exceptional and nameless infamy in both public and private life. I was a sickly, delicate boy, suffered much from asthma, and frequently had to be taken away on trips to find a place where I could breathe. One of my memories is of my father walking up and down the room with me in his arms at night when I was a very small person, and of sitting up in bed gasping, with my father and mother trying to help me. I went very little to school. I never went to the public schools, as my own children later did, both at the Cove School at Oyster Bay and at the Ford School in Washington. For a few months I attended Professor McMullen's school in 20th Street near the house where I was born, but most of the time I had tutors. As I have already said, my aunt taught me when I was small. At one time we had a French governess, a loved and valued mamselle in the household. When I was ten years old I made my first journey to Europe. My birthday was spent in Cologne, and in order to give me a thoroughly party feeling, I remember that my mother put on full dress for my birthday dinner. I do not think I gained anything from this particular trip abroad. I cordially hated it, as did my younger brother and sister. Practically all the enjoyment we had was in exploring any ruins or mountains when we could get away from our elders, and in playing in the different hotels. Our one desire was to get back to America, and we regarded Europe with the most ignorant chauvinism and contempt. Four years later, however, I made another journey to Europe, and was old enough to enjoy it thoroughly and profit by it. While still a small boy, I began to take an interest in natural history. I remember distinctly the first day that I started on my career as zoologist. I was walking up Broadway, and as I passed the market to which I used sometimes to be sent before breakfast to get strawberries, I suddenly saw a dead seal laid out on a slab of wood. That seal filled me with every possible feeling of romance and adventure. I asked where it was killed, and was informed in the harbor. I had already begun to read some of Maine Reed's books and other boys' books of adventure, and I felt that this seal brought all these adventures in realistic fashion before me. As long as that seal remained there, I haunted the neighborhood of the market day after day. I measured it, and I recall that, not having a tape measure, I had to do my best to get its girth with a folding pocket foot rule, a difficult undertaking. I carefully made a record of the utterly useless measurements, and at once began to write a natural history of my own on the strength of that seal. This and subsequent natural histories were written down in blank books in simplified spelling, wholly unpremeditated and unscientific. I had vague aspirations of, in some way or another, owning and preserving that seal, but they never got beyond the purely formless stage. I think, however, I did get the seal's skull, and with two of my cousins promptly started what we ambitiously called the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. The collections were at first kept in my room, until a rebellion on the part of the chambermaid received the approval of the higher authorities of the household, and the collection was moved up to a kind of bookcase in the back hall upstairs. It was the ordinary small boy's collection of curios, quite incongruous and entirely valueless except from the standpoint of the boy himself. My father and mother encouraged me warmly in this, as they always did in anything that could give me wholesome pleasure or help to develop me. The adventure of the seal and the novels of Maine Reed together strengthened my instinctive interest in natural history. I was too young to understand much of Maine Reed, excepting the adventure part and the natural history part. These enthralled me. But, of course, my reading was not wholly confined to natural history. There was very little effort made to compel me to read books, my father and mother having the good sense not to try to get me to read anything I did not like, unless it was in the way of study. 
I was given the chance to read books that they thought I ought to read, but if I did not like them, I was then given some other good book that I did like. There were certain books that were taboo. For instance, I was not allowed to read dime novels. I obtained some surreptitiously and did read them, but I do not think that the enjoyment compensated for the feeling of guilt. I was also forbidden to read the only one of Ouida's books which I wished to read, Under Two Flags. I did read it, nevertheless, with greedy and fierce hope of coming on something unhealthy, but as a matter of fact all the parts that might have seemed unhealthy to an older person made no impression on me whatever. I simply enjoyed, in a rather confused way, the general adventures. I think there ought to be children's books. I think that the child will like grown-up books also, and I do not believe a child's book is really good unless grown-ups get something out of it. For instance, there is a book I did not have when I was a child because it was not written. It is Laura E. Richard's Nursery Rhymes. My own children loved them dearly, and their mother and I loved them almost equally. The delightfully light-hearted man from New Mexico who lost his grandmother out in the snow, the adventures of the owl, the eel, and the warming pan, and the extraordinary genealogy of the kangaroo whose father was a whale with a feather in his tail who lived in the Greenland Sea, while his mother was a shark who kept very dark in the Gulf of Caribbee. As a small boy, I had Our Young Folks, which I then firmly believed to be the very best magazine in the world, a belief, I may add, which I have kept to this day unchanged, for I seriously doubt if any magazine for old or young has ever surpassed it. Both my wife and I have the bound volumes of Our Young Folks, which we preserved from our youth. I have tried to read again the main read books which I so dearly loved as a boy, only to find, alas, that it is impossible. But I really believe that I enjoy going over our young folks now clearly as much as ever. Cast Away in the Cold, Grandfather's Struggle for a Homestead, The William Henry Letters, and a dozen others like them were first class. Good healthy stories, interesting in the first place, and in the next place, teaching manliness, decency, and good conduct. At the cost of being deemed effeminate, I will add that I greatly liked the girls' stories, Pussy Willow and A Summer in Leslie Goldthwaite's Life, just as I worshipped Little Men and Little Women and An Old-Fashioned Girl. This enjoyment of the gentler side of life did not prevent my revealing in such tales of adventure as Ballantine stories or Marriott's Midshipman Easy. I suppose everybody has kinks in them, and even as a child there were books which I ought to have liked and did not. For instance, I never cared at all for the first part of Robinson Crusoe, and although it is unquestionably the best part, I do not care for it now. Whereas the second part, containing the adventures of Robinson Crusoe, with the wolves in the Pyrenees and out in the Far East, simply fascinated me. What I did like in the first part were the adventures before Crusoe finally reached his island, the fight with the Sally Rover, and the allusion to the strange beasts at night taking their improbable bath in the ocean. Thanks to being already an embryo zoologist, I disliked the Swiss family Robinson, because of the wholly impossible collection of animals met by that worthy family as they ambled inland from the wreck. Even in poetry it was the relation of adventures that most appealed to me as a boy. At a pretty early age I began to read certain books of poetry, notably Longfellow's poem The Saga of King Olaf, which absorbed me. This introduced me to Scandinavian literature, and I have never lost my interest in and affection for it. Among my first books was a volume of a hopelessly unscientific kind by Maine Reed about mammals, illustrated with pictures no more artistic than, but quite as thrilling as, those in the typical school geography. When my father found how deeply interested I was in this not-very-accurate volume, he gave me a little book by J. G. Wood, 
the English writer of popular books on natural history, and then a larger one of his called Holmes Without Hands. Both of these were cherished possessions. They were studied eagerly, and they finally descended to my children. The Holmes Without Hands, by the way, grew to have an added association in connection with the pedagogical failure on my part. In accordance with what I believed was some kind of modern theory of making education interesting and not letting it become a task, I endeavored to teach my eldest small boy one or two of his letters from the title page. As the letter H appeared in the title an unusual number of times, I selected that to begin on, my effort being to keep the small boy interested not to let him realize that he was learning a lesson, and to convince him that he was merely having a good time. Whether it was the theory or my method of applying it that was defective, I do not know, but I certainly absolutely eradicated from his brain any ability to learn what H was, and long after he had learned all the other letters of the alphabet in the old-fashioned way, he proved wholly unable to remember H under any circumstances. Quite unknown to myself, I was, while a boy, under a hopeless disadvantage in studying nature. I was very nearsighted, so that the only things I could study were those I ran against or stumbled over. When I was about thirteen, I was allowed to take lessons in taxidermy from a Mr. Bell, a tall, clean-shaven, white-haired old gentleman, as straight as an Indian, who had been a companion of Audubon's. He had a musty little shop, somewhat in the order of Mr. Venus's shop in Our Mutual Friend, a little shop in which he had done very valuable work for science. This vocational study, as I suppose it would be called by modern educators, spurred and directed my interest in collecting specimens for mounting and preservation. It was this summer that I got my first gun, and it puzzled me to find that my companions seemed to see things to shoot at which I could not see at all. One day they read aloud an advertisement in huge letters on a distant billboard, and I then realized that something was the matter, for not only was I unable to read the sign, but I could not even see the letters. I spoke of this to my father, and soon afterwards got my first pair of spectacles, which literally opened an entirely new world to me. I had no idea how beautiful the world was until I got those spectacles. I had been a clumsy and awkward little boy, and while much of my clumsiness and awkwardness was doubtless due to general characteristics, a good deal of it was due to the fact that I could not see, and yet was wholly ignorant of what I was not seeing. The recollection of this experience gives me a keen sympathy with those who are trying in our public schools and elsewhere to remove the physical causes of deficiency in children, who are often unjustly blamed for being obstinate or unambitious, or mentally stupid. This same summer, too, I obtained various new books on mammals and birds, including the publications of Spencer Baird, for instance, and made an industrious book study of the subject. I did not accomplish much in outdoor study because I did not get spectacles until late in the fall, a short time before I started with the rest of the family for a second trip to Europe. We were living at Dobbs Ferry on the Hudson. My gun was a breech-loading, pin-fire, double-barrel of French manufacture. It was an excellent gun for a clumsy and often absent-minded boy, there was no spring to open it, and if the mechanism became rusty, it could be opened with a brick without serious damage. When the cartridges stuck, they could be removed in the same fashion. If they were loaded, however, the result was not always happy, and I tattooed myself with partially unburned grains of powder more than once. When I was fourteen years old, in the winter of seventy-two and seventy-three, I visited Europe for the second time, and this trip formed a really useful part of my education. We went to Egypt, journeyed up the Nile, traveled through the Holy Land and part of Syria, visited Greece and Constantinople, and then we children spent the summer in a German family in Dresden. <laughs> 
My first collecting as a student of natural history was done in Egypt during this journey. By this time I had a good working knowledge of American bird life from the superficially scientific standpoint. I had no knowledge of the ornithology of Egypt, but I picked up in Cairo a book by an English clergyman, whose name I have now forgotten, who described a trip up the Nile, and in an appendix to his volume gave an account of his bird collection. I wish I could remember the name of the author now, for I owe that book very much. Without it I should have been collecting entirely in the dark, whereas with its aid I could generally find out what the birds were. My first knowledge of Latin was obtained by learning the scientific names of the birds and mammals which I collected and classified by the aid of such books as this one. The birds I obtained up the Nile and in Palestine represented merely the usual boy's collection. Some years afterward I gave them, together with the other ornithological specimens I had gathered, to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington and I think some of them also to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. I am told that the skins are to be found yet in both places and in other public collections. I doubt whether they have my original labels on them. With great pride, the directors of the Roosevelt Museum, consisting of myself and the two cousins aforesaid, had printed a set of Roosevelt Museum labels in pink ink, preliminary to what was regarded as my adventurous trip to Egypt. This bird collecting gave what was really the chief zest to my Nile journey. I was old enough and had read enough to enjoy the temples and the desert scenery and the general feeling of romance, but this in time would have palled if I had not also had the serious work of collecting and preparing my specimens. Doubtless the family had their moments of suffering, especially on one occasion when a well-meaning maid extracted from my taxidermist's outfit the old toothbrush with which I put in the skins the arsenical soap necessary for their preservation, partially washed it, and left it with the rest of my wash kit for my own personal use. I suppose that all growing boys tend to be grubby, but the ornithological small boy or indeed the boy with the taste for natural history of any kind, is generally the very grubbiest of all. An added element in my case was the fact that while in Egypt I suddenly started to grow. As there were no tailors up the Nile, when I got back to Cairo I needed a new outfit. But there was one suit of clothes too good to throw away, which we kept for a change, and which was known as my Smike suit, because it left my wrists and ankles as bare as those of poor Smike himself. When we reached Dresden, we younger children were left to spend the summer in the house of Er Minkvich, a member of either the municipal or the Saxon government, I have forgotten which. It was hoped that in this way we would acquire some knowledge of the German language and literature. They were the very kindest family imaginable. I shall never forget the unwearied patience of the two daughters. The father and mother and a shy, thin student cousin who was living in the flat were no less kind. Whenever I could get out into the country, I collected specimens industriously and enlivened the household with hedgehogs and other small beasts and reptiles, which persisted in escaping from partially closed bureau drawers. The two sons were fascinating students from the University of Leipzig, both of them belonging to dueling corps, and much scarred in consequence. One, a famous swordsman, was called Der Roth Erzog, the Red Duke, and the other was nicknamed Ernassahorn, Sir Rhinoceros, because the tip of his nose had been cut off in a duel and sewn on again. I learned a good deal of German here, in spite of myself, and above all I became fascinated with the Nibelungenlied. German prose never became really easy to me in the sense that French prose did, but for German poetry I cared as much as for English poetry. Above all, I gained an impression of the German people which I never got over. From that time to this, it would have been quite impossible to make me feel that the Germans were really foreigners. The affection, the Gemuthlichkeit, 
a quality which cannot be exactly expressed by any single English word, the capacity for hard work, the sense of duty, the delight in studying literature and science, the pride in the new Germany, the more than kind and friendly interest in three strange children, all these manifestations of the German character and of German family life made a subconscious impression upon me which I did not in the least define at the time, but which is very vivid still, forty years later. When I got back to America, at the age of fifteen, I began serious study to enter Harvard under Mr. Arthur Cutler, who later founded the Cutler School in New York. I could not go to school because I knew so much less than most boys of my age in some subjects and so much more in others. In science and history and geography and in unexpected parts of German and French I was strong, but lamentably weak in Latin and Greek and mathematics. My grandfather had made his summer home in Oyster Bay a number of years before, and my father now made Oyster Bay the summer home of his family also. Along with my college preparatory studies, I carried on the work of a practical student of natural history. I worked with greater industry than either intelligence or success, and made very few additions to the sum of human knowledge, but to this day, Certain obscure ornithological publications may be found in which are recorded such items as, for instance, that on one occasion a fish crow, and on another an Ipswich sparrow, were obtained by one Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., at Oyster Bay, on the shore of Long Island Sound. In the fall of 1876 I entered Harvard, graduating in 1880. I thoroughly enjoyed Harvard, and I am sure it did me good, but only in the general effect, for there was very little in my actual studies which helped me in after life. More than one of my own sons have already profited by their friendship with certain of their masters in school or college. I certainly profited by my friendship with one of my tutors, Mr. Cutler, and in Harvard I owed much to the professor of English, Mr. A. S. Hill. Doubtless through my own fault, I saw almost nothing of President Eliot and very little of the professors. I ought to have gained much more than I did gain from writing the themes and forensics. My failure to do so may have been partly due to my taking no interest in the subjects. Before I left Harvard, I was already writing one or two chapters of a book I afterwards published on the Naval War of 1812. Those chapters were so dry that they would have made a dictionary seem light reading by comparison. Still, they represented purpose and serious interest on my part, not the perfunctory effort to do well enough to get a certain mark, and corrections of them by a skilled older man would have impressed me and have commanded my respectful attention. But I was not sufficiently developed to make myself take an intelligent interest in some of the subjects assigned me. The character of the Gracchi, for instance. A very clever and studious lad would no doubt have done so, but I personally did not grow up to this particular subject until a good many years later. The frigate and sloop actions between the American and British sea tigers of 1812 were much more within my grasp. I worked drearily at the Gracchi because I had to. My conscientious and much-to-be-pitied professor dragged me through the theme by main strength, with my feet firmly planted in dull and totally idea-proof resistance. I had at the time no idea of going into public life, and I never studied elocution or practiced debating. This was a loss to me in one way. In another way, it was not. Personally, I have not the slightest sympathy with debating contests in which each side is arbitrarily assigned a given proposition and told to maintain it without the least reference to whether those maintaining it believe in it or not. I know that under our system this is necessary for lawyers, but I emphatically disbelieve in it as regards general discussion of political, social, and industrial matters. What we need is to turn out of our colleges young men with ardent convictions on the side of the right, not young men who can make a good argument for either right or wrong as their interest bids them, 
The present method of carrying on debates on such subjects as our colonial policy, or the need of a navy, or the proper position of the courts in constitutional questions, encourages precisely the wrong attitude among those who take part in them. There is no effort to instill sincerity and intensity of conviction. On the contrary, the net result is to make the contestants feel that their convictions have nothing to do with their arguments. I am sorry I did not study elocution in college, but I am exceedingly glad that I did not take part in the type of debate in which stress is laid not upon getting a speaker to think rightly, but on getting him to talk glibly on the side to which he is assigned, without regard either to what his convictions are or to what they ought to be. I was a reasonably good student in college, standing just within the first tenth of my class, if I remember rightly, although I am not sure whether this means the tenth of the whole number that entered or of those that graduated. I was given a Phi Beta Kappa key. My chief interests were scientific. When I entered college, I was devoted to out-of-doors natural history, and my ambition was to be a scientific man of the Audubon or Wilson or Baird or Coué type, a man like Hart Merriam or Frank Chapman or Hornaday today. My father had from the earliest days instilled into me the knowledge that I was to work and to make my own way in the world, and I had always supposed that this meant that I must enter business. But in my freshman year, he died when I was a sophomore, he told me that if I wished to become a scientific man, I could do so. He explained that I must be sure that I really intensely desired to do scientific work, because if I went into it, I must make it a serious matter, that he had made enough money to enable me to take up such a career and do non-remunerative work of value if I intended to do the very best work there was in me but that I must not dream of taking it up as a dilettante. He also gave me a piece of advice that I have always remembered, namely that if I was not going to earn money, I must even things up by not spending it. As he expressed it, I had to keep the fraction constant, and if I was not able to increase the numerator, then I must reduce the denominator. In other words, if I went into a scientific career, I must definitely abandon all thought of the enjoyment that would accompany a money-making career, and must find my pleasures elsewhere. After this conversation, I fully intended to make science my life work. I did not, for the simple reason that at that time Harvard, and I suppose our other colleges, utterly ignored the possibilities of the faunal naturalist, the outdoor naturalist, and observer of nature. They treated biology as purely a science of the laboratory and the microscope, a science whose adherents were to spend their time in the study of minute forms of marine life, or else in section cutting and the study of the tissues of the higher organisms under the microscope. This attitude was, no doubt, in part due to the fact that in most colleges then there was a not always intelligent copying of what was done in the great German universities. The sound revolt against superficiality of study had been carried to an extreme. Thoroughness in minutia as the only end of study had been erected into a fetish. There was a total failure to understand the great variety of kinds of work that could be done by naturalists, including what could be done by outdoor naturalists, the kind of work which Hart Merriam and his assistants in the biological survey have carried to such a high degree of perfection as regards North American mammals. In the entirely proper desire to be thorough and to avoid slipshod methods, the tendency was to treat as not serious, as unscientific, any kind of work that was not carried on with laborious minuteness in the laboratory. My taste was specialized in a totally different direction, and I had no more desire or ability to be a microscopist and section cutter than to be a mathematician. Accordingly, I abandoned all thought of becoming a scientist. Doubtless, this meant that I really did not have the intense devotion to science which I thought I had, for if I had possessed such devotion, I would have carved out a career for myself somehow without regard to discouragements. 
As regards political economy, I was, of course, while in college, taught the laissez-faire doctrines, one of them being free trade, then accepted as canonical. Most American boys of my age were taught both by their surroundings and by their studies certain principles which were very valuable from the standpoint of national interest, and certain others which were very much the reverse. The political economists were not especially to blame for this. It was the general attitude of the writers who wrote for us of that generation. Take my beloved Our Young Folks the magazine of which I have already spoken, and which taught me much more than any of my textbooks. Everything in this magazine instilled the individual virtues and the necessity of character as the chief factor in any man's success, a teaching in which I now believe as sincerely as ever, for all the laws that the wit of man can devise will never make a man a worthy citizen unless he has within himself the right stuff unless he has self-reliance, energy, courage, the power of insisting on his own rights, and the sympathy that makes him regardful of the rights of others. All this individual morality I was taught by the books I read at home and the books I studied at Harvard. But there was almost no teaching of the need for collective action and of the fact that in addition to, not as a substitute for, individual responsibility, there is a collective responsibility. Books such as Herbert Crowley's Promise of American Life and Walter E. Weil's New Democracy would generally at that time have been treated either as unintelligible or else as pure heresy. The teaching which I received was genuinely democratic in one way. It was not so democratic in another. I grew into manhood thoroughly imbued with the feeling that a man must be respected for what he made of himself. But I had also, consciously or unconsciously, been taught that socially and industrially pretty much the whole duty of the man lay in thus making the best of himself that he should be honest in his dealings with others, and charitable in the old-fashioned way to the unfortunate, but that it was no part of his business to join with others in trying to make things better for the many by curbing the abnormal and excessive development of individualism in a few. Now, I do not mean that this training was by any means all bad. On the contrary, the insistence upon individual responsibility was, and is, and always will be, a prime necessity. Teaching of the kind I absorbed, from both my textbooks and my surroundings, is a healthy anti-scorbutic to the sentimentality which by complacency excusing the individual for all his shortcomings would finally hopelessly weaken the spring of moral purpose. It also keeps alive that virile vigor for the lack of which in the average individual no possible perfection of law or of community action can ever atone. But such teaching, if not corrected by other teaching, means acquiescence in a riot of lawless business individualism which would be quite as destructive to real civilization as the lawless military individualism of the Dark Ages. I left college and entered the big world owing more than I can express to the training I had received, especially in my own home, but with much else also to learn if I were to become really fitted to do my part in the work that lay ahead for the generation of Americans to which I belonged. End of chapter 1 Recording by Roger Moline